All right, you ready? Open your ears. Hear the word of the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 through 3 tells us about a great man who was an enemy of Israel, who God had used to discipline his people, who while he was raiding, captured and took captive a young girl from the Israelites. They bring her into their home and she's serving the great captain's wife. And the scripture gives us through implied information, the notion that though Naaman and his wife had taken this girl captive, they must have been very kind to her. Because she, the girl, was sympathetic to Naaman's plight and the fact that he had leprosy. So the little girl told Naaman's wife that she was working for. She said, you know what? I wish our master, I wish Naaman would, um, would go to Samaria and see the prophet there. Because if he could go and see this prophet, he could get healed of his leprosy. First of 11 lessons from lepers, number one is your answer is often inside your circle. I'm going to say it again. It's powerful. You've been banging your head, looking everywhere for answers. Listen to me. Your answer is often inside your circle. The grace of God has established and ordained. God does not have his people walking around confused, walking around not knowing what to do. The grace of God has ordained that most times, most often, your answer is inside, somewhere in your circle. Psalm 32, 7, David said, God, you surround us surround like a circle. You surround us with songs of deliverance. One translation says you surround us with the answer that brings deliverance. So your answer is somewhere in your circle. Get to looking, get to sweeping, get to knocking, seeking and asking because your answer, whatever that confusing problem is, whatever that difficulty is, whatever that thing that you keep running up against is, the answer is somewhere in your circle. But Point number two, your help is often outside your circle. Okay. Your help is often outside your circle because verse nine says he got the answer in his house. The answer was in his house. The girl said, I know somebody that can fix you. Okay. But there's a difference in the answer and the help. A lot of people come to get they come to church to get answers and they get them, not realizing sometimes you have to go outside your circle to get the help that you need. Okay. So the answer comes in his house, but then verse nine says he shows up in Samaria at the prophet's door knocking. He had to go outside of his circle, outside of his comfort zone to get the help. Okay. God will be faithful to send you the answers. But you have to be faithful to go get the help. Amen. This teaches a dynamic of agreement. Everybody say agreement. Agreement between your hearing and your doing. The scripture says, do not just be hearers of the word, but also be doers of the word. God will send the word and God will make sure the answer is always close to you. But once you get the word, you've got to go do something with it to get the help. Faith comes by hearing. But the thing about it is, if you only get the hearing and you only get the faith, but you never do any action, it's not going to help you. The scripture says faith without works is dead being alone. So you have to have the power of agreement, which takes the answer that you heard and the action that you need to do and puts them together. Okay. And so Naaman goes to the prophet's house. He knocks on the door. The prophet don't even come to the door. The prophet sends his servant Gehazi. The prophet gives Gehazi the word to give to Naaman. The prophet don't get out of bed. Gehazi is doing all the work. He's doing all the preaching. He's giving Naaman the answer. He's giving Naaman the response. And the word of the Lord is, and the response of the Lord is, Naaman, I want you to take yourself down to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Now, if you know anything about the Hebrews typography back then and how they set up their society, they didn't have aqueducts. They weren't an advanced civilization like the Romans or the Greeks. So they, they put all of their human waste 
because human waste is a, is a problem that's got to be solved for any major society. They put all their human waste in the Jordan River and everybody knew it. So initially, you know, this conquering hero that has conquered Israel comes back into Israel to get help with his leprosy. And the response he gets and the word he gets is go dip where we take a And I bet initially he thought, y'all trying to get me. Y'all mess with me. Y'all want to get over on me, you know? I bet y'all would like to see the person who conquered y'all go down and dip in y'all's. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. And yet, he does it. Desperation is the ingredient required for miracles. Okay. So out of his desperation, he goes and he gets in the Jordan and folks point number three, this is so good to me. Follow through is the proof of faith. A lot of people say they have faith, but have no follow through. If you've really got faith, there will be follow through. Say the word because it's powerful. Say follow through. Now say the word to you and pat yourself and say, follow through. God's given you some instructions. God's given you some words. God's given you some stuff to do. God's given you some answers. The only thing left to do is follow through. Okay. God told you that health problem you had would, would uh, eradicate itself if you'd lose 40 pounds. And you shouted and you got the word and you got the revelation, you got all the information and you went and studied and figured out how to do it and figured out what you needed to buy for the diet, figured out what gym you were going to go to. And, and it's all, it's all just been sitting on the shelf because of your lack of follow through. You want God to zap you and the weight just fall off. It is never going to happen. That is not how this works. You have to follow through. God gave you the answer through his word, what would fix that marriage, but you don't want to do the work. You just want to be zapped and everything go back to being lovely. No, you've got to follow through because follow through is the proof of faith. You want to get better? Prove it. You want to go to another level? Prove it. You want to get healthier? Prove it. You want to get stronger? Prove it. How bad do you want it? follow through. I know Naaman was checking his body every time he dipped. Yeah, he's got to dip seven times. You know, he dips once in that messy, nasty, filthy, dirty, disgusting. He dips once, looks, it ain't working. Dips twice, you know, expecting this at least going to get a little better, you know, nothing. Dips the third time, said, I know they got me. Follow through is tested when you start working the process and it don't seem to be working. But for Naaman, it never worked until the follow through was complete. Okay. You tried what God said and it didn't work and you got mad. You turned your back on the instruction. It's not that it didn't work. It's that you didn't follow through. Listen, listen, doubt does not cancel miracles. That's an erroneous teaching in the body of Christ. Doubt does not cancel miracles. How do I know that? A man is standing with a demon possessed child in front of Jesus. He said, I'm, he's trying to throw himself in the water and drown himself. He tries to throw himself in the fire and burn himself. He said, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't heal him. He says, if you can do anything, please heal my son. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to them who believe. But the man said to the face of Christ, I believe, but help my unbelief. In other words, I got faith and doubt working at the same time. And you know, if you read the rest of the story, that the man's doubt did not cancel his miracle. Jesus healed the boy. Why? All you have to do 
is allow your real faith to follow through even when there's doubt. Can you see Naaman dipping the fifth time, dipping the sixth time? Okay. What made him dip the seventh when it hadn't worked the previous six times? Faith and follow through is the proof of faith. Look at somebody one more time. Say follow through. Then he gets out seventh time. He's healed. He's praising God. He's thankful. And you know, he, he's a rich man. Money's not the problem for him, you know, and he's so grateful to be healed. Uh, he goes back to Elisha, the prophet, the one who gave him the word of instruction. And he said, man, I want to give you some money. I want to give you a gift. I want to give you a reward. And Elisha says, no, I, I can't take your money. Yeah. Now, people have foolishly taught that, you know, it was somehow wrong for Elisha to have received the money or it would have somehow been a, a stain on God if Elisha would have used the power of God to perform a miracle and then accepted some kind of gift for it. No, it wasn't about none of that. Elisha's primary responsibility is to be the prophet of the nation of Israel. And as a result, he has to stay in allegiance and in covenant with the king of Israel. Okay. The king of Israel has just been conquered by Naaman. So Elisha doesn't want to take a gift from his friend's enemy. Like I said earlier, not every gift is a present. Okay. You shouldn't take something, not, not from everybody, because, because sometimes gifts come with strings attached, and sometimes those strings don't have nothing to do with the person who gives it. Elisha knows if the king of Israel hears that I took money from his enemy, it's going to put a breach in our relationship. It's going to cause a fracture in what I'm called to do. Listen, you have to steward and guard the relationships that God gives you very carefully. Number one, starting with your marriage. Your marriage is the most important relationship that God has given you. So listen, spouses, don't receive things that will cause you to be compromised with your spouse. Hallelujah. Don't shout me down. Y'all quiet down. I can't preach. You're yelling too loud. Don't receive a friend request that will cause you to be compromised with your spouse. Don't receive a rose from somebody that would cause you to be compromised with your spouse. Don't receive a compliment from somebody that would cause you to be compromised with the more important relationship. Don't receive a text message. Don't, don't, don't reciprocate flirtatious behavior. Don't receive something and think, well, I'm just going to keep this to myself. No. Nobody ever tells me that I'm beautiful. And, and James saw me at the coffee station. He said, you sure are beautiful. And I needed that compliment because nobody thinks that I'm beautiful. And I, I work on this house and clean this house and take care of these kids. And, and my husband don't ever tell me. And I'm just going, no. It, put, it, it compromises you on the, on the more important relationship. There was nothing wrong with the goal. And there was nothing wrong with the silver. The reason Elisha didn't take it is he didn't want the king to think that he had switched allegiance. The people that matter to you in your life always need to know where you stand. Listen, especially during times of crisis, especially when it's hot, especially when there's a boiling fire of difficulty going on. The people in your life that matter need to know where you stand and where your allegiances lie, because we have enough experience in life that we have found out when things get difficult, usually people cut and run. They abandon you. They walk out on you. They betray you. They leave you. They steal from you. They rob from you. They walk out. And, and so, and so Elisha doesn't want the king of Israel thinking that he's switching. Okay. So he said, Naaman, I don't want your money, man. Ain't, ain't nothing wrong. It ain't cursed money. It ain't evil money. It ain't bad money. I just don't want it because I've got a, 
a God connection, a God relationship, somebody God put me with. And I can't afford for the one God put me with to misunderstand your motives. And Elijah doesn't want to go have to explain it. You know, it's best to keep yourself out of the situations that you have to overly explain. Oh, preach Jason sides, preach Jason sides. I said it's best to keep yourself out of relationships, out of situations that you have to go back and overly explain. It's best not to say things that you have to go back later and over it. Well, this, this is what I meant, and I didn't mean that, and I wasn't trying to say it. It's best. So Elisha said, uh-uh, you take that money back home with you. That money ain't nothing but a mess in my future. Elisha goes back in the house, closes the door, gets back into bed. Gehazi, Elisha's servant, he's sitting there thinking, hold on a second. You didn't even give him that word. You stayed in the bed and sent me down there. I've been doing all the preaching. I've been doing all the working. I've been doing all the dealing with them, you know, and, and you didn't take any money. So Gehazi said to himself in verse 20, I will run after Naaman and I'm going to go get that money. So Gehazi goes to Naaman and he said, you wouldn't believe it. Funniest thing happened. Some of the prophets, your know, spiritual sons have come and, um, and the prophet, he don't want nothing for himself. And I certainly don't want nothing for me, but if we could bless these two little young pastors that just came, if you have a little gold or silver on you and, and Gehazi asked for one bag, Naaman's so appreciative and so generous and so big in his heart. He said, no man, not one here. Let me give you two. And Gehazi's thinking, thank you, Lord. I'm just blessed. <clears throat> Gehazi takes it and he hides it. He takes it and he hides it. Because I've got to get something for me. I've been serving. I've been working. We're always getting into trouble. Somebody's always chasing us. I'm always having to pour water on the hands of the man of God. I need something for me. So he hides the gold. Comes in. Elisha said, where you been, bud? <laughs> Big statement Gehazi makes. Watch this. Watch this. This is the man that could hear so good he knew what was going on in the king's bedchamber. This is the man that has walked in faith and power. This is the man who has prayed and raised the dead while Gehazi was standing there. This is the man. Elisha is operating in a double portion of Elijah's man, uh, mantle in ministry. And Gehazi has the nerve to stand, look that kind of man in the face and say, I ain't been nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. And Elisha says something heartbreaking, heartbreaking. He says, did not my heart go with you when you chased that man down the street to ask for that money? Notice he didn't say my spirit went with you. He didn't say I discerned this with my spirit. He didn't say my gift was watching you, my prophetic eye. No, 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 no. He said my heart, because when you serve with people, your heart gets connected to them, whether you like it or not, you know, your heart gets connected. And when somebody that your heart's connected to begins to drift from you, you don't have to pray in the Holy Ghost. You don't have to go to church and get anointed with oil and have your ears anointed so you can hear secret. Con you can feel it in your heart. Did not my heart go with you when you went to chase that man down? Elisha said, because you have done this thing, the leprosy that was on Naaman is now on you. And the scripture says that Gehazi went out, put verse 27 up there, 2 Kings 5, 27. Put that up there on the screen. I want you to see, because I don't want you to think I'm making this up. Verse 27. 
and he went out from his presence, leprous, watch, as white as snow. You don't change. The color of your skin doesn't change in leprosy until the advanced stages, until death is near. So he didn't just give him leprosy. He got cursed with an advanced stage leprosy. This is the place where you start losing digits and start falling apart, you know, and then he went out from a few points from what we just uh, summarized. Point number four, proximity can lead to neglect. It was Gehazi's proximity to the things of God, being so close to the things of God, being so faithful, being immersed around the word of God, being immersed in the presence of God. One side effect of that kind of close proximity is it can lead to neglect and you taking the things of God for granted. Don't take it for granted. Don't take your church for granted. Don't take your pastor for granted. Don't take the word for granted. Don't take the ministry, the anointing, the grace. Do not take it for granted. And then, and then, point number five from verse 20, Gehazi said, I will run after Naaman. Point number five, whatever you run after reveals the condition of your heart. You can see this in your children. You can see it in your spouse. You can see it at work. You can see it in people. You can watch people change because whatever you start running after reveals the condition of your heart. Number six, still from these seven verses, verses 20 from 20 through 27. Number six, your outward condition will follow your inward direction. Your outward condition will follow your inward direction. Okay. Gehazi got leprosy on the outside in his outward condition because of what was going on in his inward direction. The outside follows the inside. Look at somebody and tell them the outside follows the inside. There are some people that have aged 20 years older than they look. Okay. I'm not going to point you out, but, but there are people that you would be shocked. They're only 55 years old because they look 70. <laughs> there are people you would be shocked that are the age that they are because the outside has aged faster than their biological age. Why the outside condition directly correlates to the inward direction. By the same token, there are people like the bishop that when you find out the bishop is 70 years old, it's amazing because he looks so good and he's so spry and he's so healthy and he's so strong. You know, all of you know people in your life, you know, in their 70s or in their 80s and you all sit around and say, I don't know what kind of polish they are using because they look amazing for their age. And don't you want to be one of those people? If you have to get old, don't you want to be able to get old but not look like you're old? Has to do, listen, has to do not just with vitamins and minerals and not, has to do with a great deal. The direction of your heart, the outward condition correlates to the inward direction of your heart right now in this moment, holler right now, no holler right now, right now. You're either getting better or worse on the outside because of the condition of the inside. Listen to this preacher right now. You're either getting better or worse on the outside, younger or older. Okay. Better looking or worse looking. And a lot of it correlates to thy direction of your heart. Okay. Now, Take me to 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. So Elisha puts leprosy on him and sends him out. 
which is particularly difficult because if you do, if you just read it and study this out, you'll find out all this has taken place, this name and incident and all this stuff, all this has taken place in a famine. And when there's a famine, a time of, of national crisis, uh, the people that feel it the worst are people that are down and out, you know? Like uh, our country's going through inflation right now. You know, some of the people that are feeling it the worst are the homeless. During the pandemic, the people that had it the worst were the homeless. Or the people who are infirmed or they're sick already or they have a pre-existing condition, you know, all these kind of things. When national crisis hits, it's the people who are sick or the people who are less fortunate that get hit the hardest. So Gehazi has been cursed with leprosy at the absolute worst time. The Bible says the uh, famine was so bad that they were selling dove dung, dove droppings, dove excrement. They were selling them for gold and people were buying them because they were so hungry. Okay. So for a leper, you weren't allowed to go inside the gate of the city. That was a law because leprosy was contagious. So they quarantined lepers, but out of a mercy, they would let them stand outside the gate. That way people could walk by the gate and if they had anything, they could just throw it to them. They could throw them some bread or throw them some, you know, fruit or throw them something. And that's how lepers survived in this day, right? So Elisha comes to the gate of the city at a time when the famine is bad, bad. And he stands up in the gate, which would have meant if there was any lepers around, they would have, they would have over heard. And he says, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. An officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, you're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to eat of it. Well, well, one man is standing at the gate and he hears it and he says, God would have to open the windows of heaven to make what you're saying come to pass. But there was a second group of people that heard it. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate and Gehazi was one of the four. He's white as snow, falling apart, advanced stages of leprosy, but he sees his former pastor walk to the gate, clear his throat, and give a word from the Lord. Gehazi is backslidden, he's been greedy, and he's living with the recompense of his own bad decisions, but... When you've ever served the Lord, your hearing is the last thing to go. You may be down real low. You may be in a bad place. You may be in a sinful place. You may be in a broken place, but there's something about serving the Lord. If you ever served the Lord, if you ever got into the kingdom, if you ever worked the fields of the Lord, something happens to your ear because you got to be able to hear the word of the Lord. And so here he is in his backslidden sinful greedy state, but the, 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 the words that his former pastor is saying is starting to carry to his ear and it's waking up something on the inside of him because it doesn't matter how long you've been away. It doesn't matter how long you've been backslid. It doesn't matter how sinful you are. It doesn't matter how broken you are. If you can still hear the word of the Lord, I might not be holy, but I can still hear. I might still have a lot of issues, but but I can still hear. I might have walked away from my loyalty and walked away from my position, but I can still hear. Yeah. 
He said, hear the word of the Lord. And something in Gehazi's dying body started leaping. He said, hear the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord started bringing resurrection to a man that was dying while he was walking. He said, hear the word of the Lord. And when Gehazi heard that, he started to doubt the conditions he was seeing rather than doubt the word of the Lord. He started to doubt the efficacy of the famine rather than to doubt the word of the Lord. Because some of us, we got issues. We're broken, but we still believe God. We still believe in the preached word. We still believe in prophecy. We still believe in the word. Hear the word of the Lord. Gehazi said, yes. Yes. It's amazing. You can be out of church for a long time. You can be in the world system. You can be living like the devil, but you stumble around and turn on the radio when somebody's preaching or turn on the TV or call across social media. You mess around and get a word from the Lord. You start saying yes. Yes. Amen to that. Be it unto me according to the word of the Lord. That's a good word. You can hear some that other people can't hear. Look, what I'm trying to get you to see is the benefit of serving the way he served and seeing what he saw while he was serving is he could hear on a frequency. Look, the leper, the greedy, filthy, cursed leper could hear what the other man in the gate could not. The other man in the gate heard tomorrow about this time. He said, God would have to open windows in heaven for that to happen. Gehazi, this broke down, messed up, greedy guy heard it. He said, all right, it's time to move then. It's time to make something happen. It's time to make some changes. It's time to get in gear. It's time to get ready because God is about to do something. I've seen him prophesy like that before. I heard him preach like that before. Every time I've been with him, I've seen him pull dead people up out of the coffin. I've seen him perform miracles. I've seen him multiply a widow's oil. I have seen him change a nation by saying, hear the word of the Lord. So Gehazi's looking. He's looking and he's antsy. He's looking and he's antsy. He says, tomorrow about, to, to, tomorrow about, this, tomorrow about this time. And so one of those lepers said to another, the one of them being Gehazi, why sit we here until we die? In other words, if God's going to move, we need to move. Did I give you that point? Did I give you that point? Number seven, the hearing of a servant is the last thing to go. The hearing of a servant is the last thing to go. That's why you should find a place. You should bull your way into a place to serve this church because there's a difference in the hearing of a church attender and the hearing of a servant. <laughs> Woo. Okay, so, so he said to those other three lepers, because, because he was living in a circle that was too small for him. See, when you backslide and you walk away from God, you will find yourself congregating with things that really are beneath your level. This is what happened to the prodigal son. He went out and spent his inheritance on riotous living, but he found himself living in a pig pen, sharing the husks with the hogs. Because when you walk away from your father, when you walk away from your destiny, when you walk away from your purpose, the curse of it is you know you're better than the environment that you are living in. And some of you know you're better than the friends you've been talking to. You know you're better than the people you've been hanging out with. You know you're better better with the crowd that you've allowed to surround you. You know you're better than that boy you're dating. You know you're better. I ain't called for this. But, but he's stuck there until he hears the word of the Lord. And he looks at those other lepers. He said, why sit we here until we die? 
It's a funny thing. I heard somebody testifying the other day how they would go to the bar and they would snort cocaine and they would get blasted on liquor. And then they would turn around to all the other drunks and drug addicts and start preaching in the bar. Because there's something about it. It's contradicting. It's a paradox. But there's something about hearing the word of the Lord that no matter what state you find yourself in, a real word from God will get in your belly and start boiling. A real word from God will get you thinking faith instead of doubt. A real word from God will have you start asking yourself quick. Oh, hallelujah. It's dangerous when a believer starts asking themselves why. Why do I have to be depressed? Why do I have to be sick? Why do I have to be broke? Why do I have to be lonely? Why do I have to be anxious? Why? Oh, I feel a praise up in this house. I feel somebody cooking that why question up. Why do I have to watch my children go to hell? Why do I have to put up with this on my job? Why do I have to drown in this debt? Why? That's the first thing. Oh, hallelujah. That's the first thing a real word from God will make you do. It'll start making you ask yourself why. Why have I settled for this sin-soaked situation? Why have I settled to lose my soul? Why have I settled to... Why sit we here till we die? Look, here's the thing. If we go into the city, there ain't nothing there. Die there. If we stay here, we're going to die. No. Why don't we just go to the enemy's camp? Listen, I submit to you, he would have never said that. Because it was suicide. He would have never said that had he not heard the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord will make you step out on faith and do stuff other people think is crazy. The word of the Lord will make you start that business when everybody else says it would fail. The word of the Lord will make you write that book when everybody else says, no, it's impossible. The word of the Lord will give you the release to buy that property and then sell it three months later for triple the profit. The word of the, I've seen the word of the Lord give some business people some insight and instruction that took them from thousand heirs to millionaires. Oh, because of the word of the Lord and everybody else thought they were crazy. Yeah. He's sitting there. He's sitting there. Why? Why can't I pay my bills? Why can't I get an open door? Why can't I get a break? Because, and what he's starting to do is he's starting to pull his being into agreement. I just heard the word of the Lord. But he knows from his experience walking with the man of God that hearing is not enough. Once you hear it and you get the faith, now you got to put your faith in action. So he said, I'm getting up and I'm going to the enemy's camp. I'm going to the enemy's camp. I'm going to the least likely place. I'm going where they said I couldn't be blessed. I'm going where I'm not accepted. I'm going where I will know I will be rejected. But if God be for me, he's more than the world against me. And God wouldn't have given me that kind of word if he wasn't going to do something in my life that made no sense. So, goes. And the Bible said... When those lepers got up and started walking, it was twilight. And then a few verses later, it says that God made the Syrian army hear the voices and the noises and the sounds as if three armies were coming after them. You know what that means? That means God amplified the sound of the footsteps of four broken lepers and made them sound like an army to the enemy. Because faith 
will always amplify your movements. <laughs> Next point. God moves when faith moves. Even if the faith is from someone that's flawed. Oh, that's a humdinger. I'd take a picture of it. God moves when faith moves. Even if it's faith from the flawed. Gehazi might have been a leper. He might have been broken. He might have been messed up. But he heard that word of the Lord. Got filled up with faith. And now was moving, not in his own strength. He was moving based off of the faith he received from the word of the Lord. God saw that faith moving. Listen, when God saw that faith moving, listen, when God saw that faith moving, God moved at the same time. You move at twilight, I'll move at twilight. I'll move when you move, just like that. I'll move when you move, just like. Now, Gehazi and his three little leprous cohorts. Tents, thousands of them, full of gold, silver, food, clothes, and that old thing that got him the last time came back and reintroduced itself. Yeah, you've been through so much hell, Gehazi. You, you, you've been suffering with this leprosy a long time, and I bet you'd be a whole lot more comfortable as a leper if you took some gold and you took some silver. Might even be able to find somebody that can cure it if you got enough gold. And and you've been living outside the gate, and you've been hungry, and you've been you've been hadn't had a bed to sleep in, and you hadn't had any nice clothes to put on. You've been living in rags. Why don't you take some of this for yourself? Because at every, at the end, I'll say it like that. At the end of every level, you have to pass the same test that you failed last time in order to graduate. And God loves you so much, he will keep you on the same level for years. Let you start all the way over, get all the way to the end of the level, and here comes that same old test that caused you not to move forward the last time. You fail it, you go right back to the start, you get to walk the long road again. When you come up to the, to the, to the end of the level, ready to graduate, you'll always be represented with the same test you failed last time. That's why your issues are cyclical. That's why about every five years, you deal with the same thing. That's why in every generation, we see the same issues like mama, like daughter, like son. Because okay. when you don't pass the test, you get to repeat it till you die, then your kids get to take over. There Gehazi is. I know what to do with this. I'm going to do what I did last time. I'm going to go hide it. And they did. Until he got to thinking. You know what? There may be a chance for me to get more than blessed here. You done checked out and left me, hadn't you? 
Because don't we just fixate if I could just get blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed in the city. Blessed in the field. Blessed when I come, when I go. Blessed when I steal. Blessed when I lie. Blessed when I cheat. Blessed when I haven't changed my character. Blessed, 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 blessed. All of a sudden, he figures, you know what? Maybe there's something more important than being blessed. Maybe I could be made whole. <laughs> Priest Jason Sides. Maybe, maybe instead of just getting blessed, I can get better. So he dug up his treasure. He said, this ain't right. He said, if we hide this and we keep it to ourselves, he said, boys, I tried that last time and I ended up, I ended up like this. Let's take this to the king. Let's submit To the established authority that's over. You know what he's doing, folks. Listen, this is what he should have done the first time. The problem wasn't him taking Naaman's money. The problem's what he did with it. If he would have taken Naaman's money and gone straight to the king and submitted it to the king, you know the king would have rewarded him. It just wouldn't have been as much as he wanted. Okay. He failed the submission test. Okay. Okay. So he says, you know what we're going to do? We are going to break this cycle that landed me in this condition. We're going to go to the next level. We're going to pass the test of this opportunity. If he would have taken Naaman's money to the king, it wouldn't have caused problems between the king and Elisha. It would have blessed the king. If he would have taken Naaman's money to the king, look at the imagery. The king's enemy would have had to bless him. The king's enemy would have been made his footstool. It would have been the plan of God in action. But he was greedy. And he held on to what he should have released. So this time he says, no, he says, I'm going to the king and he goes straight to the king. And not only does he give the bunny, he gives the good news. The enemy you thought was going to destroy you has been completely annihilated by God. <laughs> listen, listen, hear the word of the Lord. The enemy you thought was going to destroy you has been completely annihilated by God. You're still hiding in your castle, afraid for what Monday holds, or afraid of what the test results hold, or afraid of what next Thursday afternoon's court case holds. But what you haven't realized is, while you were hiding, God has dealt with your enemies. But he, but he says, I won't give you this. I won't give you this. And then he falls off the page. We don't see him. Seven years go by. We don't see him until second Kings chapter eight. Seven years later, something interesting happens. Give me second Kings chapter eight, verse four. Look at this word with me. Seven years after this, the king talked. With Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, please, all the great things. Elisha, tell me some stories, son, about all the great things. Elisha says, Do you know what this means? It was illegal for a leper to occupy the palace, especially to talk with the king, because it was contagious. You don't want to lose the head of state. That means, folks, that this leper who was greedy and broken and nasty, not only, not only 
was he used by God to bring the news of the deliverance of Israel. Not only was he blessed extravagantly and rewarded by the king, but the curse that had brought the leprosy was broken off of him. And he was restored. He was restored. Let me give you the last two. Number eight, restoration is a decision. All of Gehazi's restoration could be tied back to the decision he made. Okay. And then, and then, number nine. I already told you this when God moves, when faith moves, even if the faith is from the flawed. And then number 10, you got to break the cycle of behavior that brought you down the last time. And then finally, number 11, 11 lessons from lepers. Number 11, there's glory in your story. So tell it, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Elisha would have been gone by now. Okay. Elisha would have been gone by now. His bones would be rotting in a cave that later a dead soldier would be thrown on. And when the dead soldier touched his bones, he would come back to life. But, but he'd be, he'd be gone now. And, and notice the king and the nation is still being comforted by the stories of what Gehazi told that Elisha did through the power of Almighty God. Listen to me. There's power in your story. Listen, God's power is lodged within your testimony. God's power, the power that touched you and healed you 10 years ago. When you tell your story, that same power begins to flow when you tell your story. That power that delivered you from addiction, when you begin to tell your story, that power, that glory begins to flow. There is glory in your story. And the, and the king said, in absence of the man of God, I still need his power. I still need his wisdom. I still need his word. I, I still need it. So can you tell me the old stories? Listen. And Gehazi, I believe in a lot of ways, he had to have been restored by God. Let me give you this. God doesn't love restoration so you can get back what you lost. God loves restoration so he can get back what he lost. You don't hear me. God isn't so committed to your restoration so you can get back what you lost. God wants your restoration so he can get back what he lost. Look at what God lost when he lost Gehazi. He lost somebody that could tell all the stories. He lost somebody that had witnessed all the miracles. He lost the storyteller. He lost the person who could remind a generation. Years after that anointing had, had died and left out of the earth, God had lost somebody that had the ability to pull that power right back down through telling a story. God wanted Gehazi to be restored more than Gehazi did. We're going to need your story. Your kids are going to need your story. Your grandkids are going to need your story. Tell me about what God did for grandma. Tell me about what God did for grandpa. Tell me about what God did for your old pastor years ago. Tell me what God did in your life. They need the story because there's glory in the story. Never stop telling your story. Write your story down. Before my grandmama died, she gave all the kids and grandkids a book of all of her stories when God showed up and worked miracles for her because there's glory. I may die, but my, the glory in my story never will. One day my name will be forgotten, but the glory in my story never will. One day they'll say, there was a man, I can't remember his name, but he had a brain-dead boy, and 
and God came in the hospital and touched that boy's brain. And a brain that was dead on a Tuesday came back to life on a Thursday with a brain scan to prove it. That's glory! Lift up your hands. The Holy Spirit of God is moving through this place right now. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. The Holy Ghost is moving. Yeah, whatever that is. Keep going. I want to call every Gehazi in the room down to the altar. If you're backslidden, if you're far from God, if you know you're better than the company you're keeping, if you believe God brought you here for you to hear this word, for you not just to be restored, but to be made whole. you got something in your life. Maybe it's in your physical health. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your mind. Maybe it's somewhere in your emotions. You want to be restored. You're sick and tired of dealing with it. Come. Come out from where you are right now. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Our elders are coming. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. We're going to believe God with you. Come, 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 come. Sing that. Come to God.